success of the gospel and the spread of Christianity. Today's topic is the classical world as a backdrop. Thank you, Brother Glenn. Thanks, Guy. Good morning, brothers and sisters. It's really exciting to be back here at uh, the gathering. Three years is a long time. And Julie and I and Grant are uh, very, very happy to be with you. And, and our daughter Cassie Giordano is with us uh, this week, too. Um, this, these last three years have been really uh, trying. It's um, something that's affected some people very harshly and severely, and others have kind of breezed through the isolation and the problems of COVID uh, with, uh, without too much difficulty. But people in analyzing these last three years have talked about it being the most destructive event in our lifetime. And when you think about it, you think about the ramifications of these last three years, I don't think we really fully understand the destruction that's taken place and it will become evident as the years go by. Um, COVID crashed the economy. Uh, the gross national uh, product fell uh, the most since the Great Depression. Uh, 22 million Americans lost their jobs in the first five weeks, and five million people have never returned to the workforce because of circumstances caused during COVID. Skip was telling me he retired during the, uh, the COVID epidemic. Every bad thing that we can think of seems to have gotten worse. Think about it in the news about drug overdoses, suicide, uh, the homelessness, illiteracy, the rise in, uh, in crime. You think about personal issues like uh, anxiety and depression and obesity and alcoholism. You think about marriages. Marriages have dropped. The birth rate has dropped during these last three years. And then, of course, the worst is you think about uh, the deaths that have occurred. And I know there's a lot of controversy over the number of people that have died because of COVID. But at least there must have been hundreds of thousands. It's been a, a very bad three years. But when we look at that, we say, Jesus is in control. We, we have that confidence and that faith that he is in control of these events and that they're leading somewhere, that they that they need something. And that kind of fits in with what we're going to be talking about this week, that we can have the confidence that, that God and his son are monitoring and directing the affairs of the world, including what's been going on in the last three years. Now, have you ever puzzled about the first appearance of Jesus Christ and why the gospel was so successful? Why did the early Christians become so committed to this belief and to the teachings of Jesus? You now Jesus was born and the message was preached in a hostile pagan environment. And it's amazing how the, the lesson that Jesus told at the fringe of the Roman Empire in the West, or moved to the West and eventually transformed and changed the Roman Empire. Uh, the religion, the culture, the politics, and eventually those beliefs and those behaviors by early Christians changed the world. And when you look at it and examine it a little bit, you're going to find that there are historical, identifiable, markers that help us understand why this happened. There are things that occur in the culture. There's things about doctrine. There's things about the behavior of the believers that are all factors that impact why Christianity was so successful, why it emerged as a, a minority religion and became the official religion of the Roman Empire in less than 300 years. And in understanding these things, these, these factors, we can kind of get an insight into the lives of the brothers and sisters. We can see their amazing faith. We can see the hand of God involved in these affairs and 
kind of directing things that are going on. And we can reflect upon the third world that we are living in today and have confidence that God knows what he's doing. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 3 says, For still the vision awaits its time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. And of course, that was spoken to the Israelites of old, but the same sentiment is true for us today. So this week, Lord willing, we're going to be looking at four aspects of the gospel as it was preached and how it impacted the believers and the Romans of the Roman Empire. Now let's have a little full disclosure here. I'm a history teacher. I taught history in high school a little bit. I'm not a historian. I do have a degree in history, but it doesn't make me any more of an expert on the things we're talking about than any of you. History is not etched in stone. Our understanding of the ancient world is constantly changing. Our understanding of the world of Jesus and Paul, the land of Judea, and the Roman Empire is constantly shifting as new discoveries are made and we have a better understanding of the past. And we need to remember that the Bible is not a history book, but it's a book about spiritual principles. It's a book about salvation for individuals today, but in times past for a nation. And it happens to be historically accurate. Even if we don't understand now how it is historically accurate. Historians, anthropologists, archaeologists, scientists, and linguists are right now applying new technology to help us better understand the past and the Bible as we have it today. So I would propose that we really live in a very, very exciting time. And I'd like to start by just going over some examples of this new technology as it applies to a biblical history and to the Bible itself. But the first one is in archaeology. Scientists use a technique called aerial archaeology now, LIDAR, L-I-D-A-R, which is light detection and ranging. It's the usage of lasers, airborne lasers, to map objects and structures that are hidden and not visible from the ground or without the use of a laser. And they've actually found, especially, especially in Central America, you know, tremendous finds that they didn't know exist because of the use of, of airborne um, techniques in archaeology. And, and we also are continuing to have new archaeological discoveries. Scientists, I think this was in 2020, discovered evidence of an ancient biblical kingdom which they kind of had thought previously was a little mythical. That's the biblical kingdom of Edom. They thought it was a loosely grouped uh, uh, of nomadic tribes. But the archaeological finds confirmed that Edom was an actual kingdom, that it existed much earlier than thought, it had a capital, it had kings, just like Genesis tells us, where it's mentioned you know, 90 or 100 times. And then there's the discovery of the kingdom of Hartupu in Anatolia, which is modern-day Turkey. And the evidence suggests that there's some connection with the legendary Midas of the Golden Touch, uh, back from the beginning of the Bronze Age. And archaeologists and historians had no idea, didn't even realize that this kingdom existed until these archaeological finds were discovered in 2020. That's current stuff going on right now. There's an interdisciplinary application of science to ancient history and to the Bible. The usage of genetic and DNA analysis of ancient seeds and plants gives an insight into the, to the climate of that day and to climate change and it also tells us about the origin and the migration of peoples from one region 
to another. There's molecular anthropologists and, get this, archaeogeneticists who are applying new techniques to this stuff. And they all help us to understand ancient history, where the Philistines came from. Uh, there's, right now, Israeli experts who gathered 10,000 ancient grape seeds were studying to learn about diseases and population decline. Archaeologists in the last 20 years studying pig bones in Roman Galilee have acknowledged that the population of Galilee and that region was much more nuanced than previously thought. We have a picture of what Galilee was like because of the New Testament times. And the archaeological evidence shows that there were fluctuations within 10-year periods where the Jews had a greater population in comparison to the Gentiles, but it was continually shifting. So there is, in, in a microcosm, how archaeology is affecting a certain region at a certain time in the first century, but it happens to be the same time that we're interested in because Jesus is active in that area. An examination of lead isotopes in the analysis of precious metals like gold and silver has come to the forefront. Scientists are able to determine where these metals came from. Now, you can't destroy silver and gold and you can't make more, so it's a finite source. And if you can tell where it came from, you can learn all sorts of things about the movement of peoples, about commerce, about trade, and that's what the study of these isotopes show. Well, what does that mean for us? Well, we, we uh, you know, are always wondering where um, Tarshish is and, the, and, the, and the, uh, the ships of Tarshish. Well, by using isotope examination of silver hordes from Phoenicia, you know, people now say that Tarshish was, and the ships of Tarshish are Sardinia and Spain. And Spain. So it expands our understanding of mercantilism. It understands our understanding of the 10th century uh, BC and the Mediterranean. And one of my pet peeves is that I've always thought that literacy in ancient Israel was much higher than historians have claimed. And, uh, that kind of makes sense. We, we see the Jews as the, the people of the Bible, the written word, right? Well, there's now confirmation that there was widespread literacy in ancient Israel. A study of ancient texts from the kingdom of Judah show that many inhabitants were able to read and write, and that literacy was not reserved for just the elite, for the religious leaders and the political leaders, that it was much more widespread. And that makes sense because of the Jews' reliance on the written word. If only a few people could read, why would you have these wonderful books written poetry and, and soaring language describing God if it was only meant for a small class of people to read and talk about. The Jews were literate in the first century. And we have confirmation of that. Look how uneducated the disciples were, but they understood Greek, they understood Arabic, they understood their own Hebrew language. They do a better job than we do today. Computers have been applied to these issues. Artificial intelligence, modern technology, has enabled us to understand our Bible better. An application of this intelligence has been used to fill gaps in Greek inscriptions and manuscripts that, that we have difficulty completing, and they've got a 71% accuracy in comparison to if the scientists do it on their own, which is only 25%. So there's an expansion of our knowledge of ancient Greek literature and Hebrew, which helps us understand and gives us insight into the Bible. It's just phenomenal things that are being applied in this day and age, and we, uh, I think we need to, to use them and, and, uh, and apply them. The, the internet is another one. The internet, on the internet, we as you know, non-scientific individuals have access to all sorts of sources. The, uh, the PHI Packard Humanities Institute has a searchable database with access to 210,000 inscriptions. This is non manuscript, non literary, non, non papyri. So they'd be monuments, grave markers, um, ostr ostracons. And there's 100 million Greek words from the ancient world included in this database. Well, if you can understand how a Greek word is used in the common world of the Greeks, over history, then it gives you a better understanding of how Greek is used in the Bible. The uh, 
The uh, thesaurus uh, lingui graca is a thesaurus of the Greek language, and it has a searchable program which incorporates all Greek literature from Homer to 600 AD, and most of Greek literature from 600 AD to 1453. A wonderful source. And these are only, only a fraction of the interdisciplinary sciences being applied to the Bible and to the classical world. And we shouldn't be afraid of that application. Often we, we're afraid that, oh, it's going to make the Bible uh, suspect and it's not going to match up with our narrative and the way we see things, but we shouldn't look at it this way. It's an exciting time. Sometimes the findings are controversial, but often they confirm what we believe and what the Bible says. And often how something is viewed at one time changes when new information comes out. So we don't need to be afraid of these, these technologies. It's really an exciting time, and we have so many sources that we can, we can use and, and draw on to understand the Bible. The truth is, this, is that we don't always have enough information to really know about the ancient historical narrative. You'd be surprised how much is not there and how much we make assumptions on based on a limited, relatively speaking, a limited amount of information. And that narrative is constantly changing as new things come to light. Remember, there's you know, no documented eyewitnesses to a lot of this information. A lot of the information is second and third hand. Look at today. We don't even agree in politics and in, in, in contemporary issues about why things happen and, 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 and you know, we disagree on all sorts of stuff. So why wouldn't it make sense that we would disagree based upon a more limited number of original sources? So we don't need to be afraid of it. We need to embrace it. So let me just give you a, a little aside. Everyone knows this verse, Luke, chapter 2 and verse 1. Now in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. This is the, the, the action that Joseph and Mary were impacted by when they had to go to Bethlehem. A lot of critics say, I was wrong. This census never happened. We have no information about it. It was a regional census. It wasn't a far wide census. That is just not resolved. But it's true, this census has not been preserved. In fact, none of the ancient Roman tax census or tax records have been saved. They've all disappeared. So it shows you how much information is not there and how much we don't have to go on when we make certain sources. Now, let me ask you a question. A survey of surviving literary sources Experts say that they've identified 50 Christian churches by 100 AD. And we know that the churches wrote letters back and forth. We have Paul, who carried on a correspondence with many of the ecclesias, and we have some of those in our Bible. In fact, we know that looking at 1 Corinthians 1 and uh, 2 Corinthians, that there's evidence that there were other letters, maybe a letter between one and two, one and a half, one, two, three, and a fourth one, and some say maybe even a fifth one is hinted at. Well, in a hundred year period of time, let's say from, from 50 AD to 150 AD, you have 50 churches, which are the churches that are identified. Let's assume because they wrote letters the only way to communicate, they wrote two letters a year, in a hundred period of time, hundred year period of time at 50 churches, that's 10,000 letters, and that's being conservative. 10,000 letters back and forth from ecclesias about the issues of their day. How many letters do we have today? Take a guess, shout it out. What do you think? 10,000 letters are probably more. How many do we have today? 100. 100? We have 50. 50 letters out of maybe 10,000 or more letters that were circulating in that day and age. So, look how much we, we don't really know. Here's another example. The, the ancient authorities, or the ancient authors like um, um, Homer, who wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey, they're writing about things that happened 100 years before they lived. 
Homer was writing in the 13th century BC. He's writing about the 13th century BC, about things that, um, he's, he's writing in the 8th century about things that happened in the 13th century. So that's 500 years there. But the oldest complete manuscript of the Iliad that we have today is from the 10th century AD. That's 1,500 years from occurrence, if it's true, from occurrence to manuscript. Bible manuscripts do better than that. But look how much historians and, and language experts and, and classicists parse the Iliad and the Odyssey. They do it as, as, as much as we do with the Greek words, with their study of the Greek words from the Iliad and the Odyssey. And they make fun of, of, of religion and by people who believe in the Bible. Archaeologist and paleomagnetism expert Ezra Ben Yusof at Tel Aviv University says that archaeology has overstated its authority. Entire kingdoms could exist under our noses and archaeologists would never find a trace. This in general I think is, is true. We make a lot of assumptions about the Bible and about history just as just as historians do. Often our modern cultural assumptions and our Bible translations create all sorts of inaccuracies. We have a bias. And one way to avoid interpretational misunderstandings and contextual mishaps is the continual study of antiquity and the ancient history and the original languages of the ancient texts. Those things are continually changing and our knowledge base is getting better. So we, we, we embrace those things and use them to uplift and encourage our faith. So this week we're going to have a lot to say about some of these limitations and our understanding of ancient history as it applies to the first century Ecclesia. So we ask a number of questions when we look at the classical world. The backdrop of the first century Ecclesia. Why, after 300 years, did Christianity beat out paganism? In 313 AD, Constantine the Great decriminalized Christianity, and in 380 AD, Emperor Theodosius I made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. Why? Why were these early Christians, these are our brothers and sisters, so firmly committed to Jesus and to this gospel message? Well, our premise is that God was working behind the scenes to bring the mighty Roman Empire into the right condition, to the right situation for a much greater purpose than the goals of the Caesars or the emperors of Rome. And this change, this condition included multiple components. It included the political scene, the economic scene, the social scene, the religious scene, and the military scene. We know that when Jesus was preaching, the Roman Empire in its military might had conquered Judea and controlled it so that when Jesus was born, the Romans were the rulers of the world. The empire, the Roman Empire brought stability, it brought protection and ease of communication and travel over great distances into all regions of the known world, into, into North Africa, into Europe, and into Asia, areas that were really not known extensively during that time. And all of these things happened shortly before Jesus was born. The empire was the controlling power that the Jews and Jesus lived under. Now, some have asked the question, why was Jesus born when he was? Well, there's an obvious answer. The simplest one is that it was in God's design. God's control. God's plan. He was directing the events so that the time was right for Jesus to appear. Or you can believe it just all happened by chance. No, I don't think it did. Galatians 4 and verse 4. But when the time had fully come, God sent forth his son, 
or the appropriate time. That, that's an idiom for the totality of a period of time being complete and everything in that period of time being accomplished and finished. That's what the Allen and Greek English lexicon of the New Testament tells us. The plan, the work of preparation was complete when that period of time was done. And that's when Jesus appeared. It was the appropriate time in God's plan. And we can be confident, brothers and sisters, that God and Christ are now using that same care in preparing the world for the return of Jesus Christ. It's the concept, it's concept of God being in control of all these things. Habakkuk 2, verses 2 and 3, speaking of the promises of Judah's deliverance from Babylon. And uh, from the Revised Standard Version, it says the appointed time, because it will surely come. I like the NET translation a little better. For the message is a witness to what is decreed. It gives reliable testimony about how matters will turn out. Even if the message is not fulfilled right away, isn't that what we say? Well, Jesus hasn't returned yet. It's been this many years since this, and we worry. Wait patiently. For it will certainly come to pass. It will not arrive late. Where is it? We think it's late, but in God's plan, it's not the appropriate time, and it is not late. And I think when we look at things that way, we get a better understanding of Daniel's statement, where God rules in the kingdom of men. Daniel 4, verse 25, speaking to Nebuchadnezzar, know that the Most High rules in the kingdoms of men. And all power in heaven and earth has been given to Jesus Christ. So he is now active in the affairs of mankind, just as his father was before. Well, there are three areas where this timing, this appropriateness was impacted. First one is the geopolitical sphere of the Roman Empire. That's the military, the government, the language, the infrastructure, as you will, of the Roman Empire. That was impacted. The other area was religion. And the last one was social. And all three of these things have a big impact on the gospel that's being preached. Why didn't uh, Jesus come earlier? Why wasn't he born earlier? Why was he born then? Well, you can examine ancient history and you can have some clues as to why the time when he appeared was the appropriate time. Just wouldn't have worked out earlier. And we can make an accurate assessment. We know the major periods. We know Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Uh, Daniel 2, Babylon, followed by Persia, followed by Greece, followed by the Roman Empire. But you can look at each of those empires, and there's certain things that come and are evident that show us that it just wouldn't have worked out at that time, that the timing was not correct. You can look at the uh, relative sizes of the empires. Uh, the land mass of the empires, uh, the Babylonian Empire was the smallest of these. The Persian, which followed the Babylonians, was the largest in square miles. Um, the, the Greece, Empire was a little smaller, but had a different area of land mass than the Persians. The Persians never made a very strong inroad into Europe, where the Grecian Empire did. In fact, you, know, you have hundreds of years of conflict with the Greeks and the Persians over Persia's attempt to invade into Europe and to conquer Greece. And then finally, you have the Romans, which shifts the emphasis from the Levant, from the eastern part of the Mediterranean, to the western, but keeps control of Palestine and Judea. So, you know, God is, is moving the governments and the empires of the ancient world and setting the stage as the Roman Empire only gradually shifts its emphasis to the west. If you look at the, uh, the Babylonian Empire, the most famous 
king was Nebuchadnezzar, and we know that Nebuchadnezzar was used to punish and reform the Jewish people. They, just, they survived and went into captivity after the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. for 70 years. The captivity worked. The Jews were reformed spiritually. And the consequence of their captivity is that they came back full of zeal and under Ezra and Nehemiah they rebuilt the city and the temple. But there are other things that happened during the captivity. Judaism was spread outside of Israel outside of Judea and the formerly ten tribes of northern Israel. And not all of the Jews returned from the captivity. And then you remember that the Assyrians deported the ten tribes of Israel. So the Jews had been in a diaspora for quite a while, which was extended and magnified when many Jews did not return from Babylon. The synagogue system was developed in captivity and became the center and focus of religious life for the Jews because why? The temple didn't exist anymore. The synagogue system continued to develop and continued right down the time to the time of Christ. What about the Persian Empire? Well, the Persian Empire facilitated the return of the captives from Persia to Jerusalem. They were the ones that financed the rebuilding of the city and the temple. And as I said, the leaders were very zealous for the work. But what else did the Persians do? Well, the Persians introduced religious toleration. Their empire was so large that they let anybody believe and worship wherever they wanted, as long as they contributed to the good of the empire. Persians also introduced to the Jews the concept that the ruler, the king, was a god. The Persians were defeated by the Grecian Empire, by Alexander the Great. I always say that the purpose of the Grecian Empire was to destroy the Persian. But I guess I'm a little biased to the Grecian over the Persians. It's interesting, in the last 25 years, there's been a, a, a tremendous increase in knowledge of the ancient Persian Empire. There are now departments and universities that study the Persian Empire. It was kind of like the neglected empire of the historical scene because we were always biased towards the Greeks. And the Greeks always thought bad of the Persians. And our Greek Western thought continued down to this day and age where, uh, who cares about the Persians? But it's a phenomenal uh, influx of new information about the Persian Empire. So the Persian Empire was destroyed by the Greeks, and they also introduced some other things, like the concept of personal freedom, the concept of the ownership, the personal ownership of property, and then of course the Athenians and democratic thought. And all those things kind of have trickled down to what we have today in our democratic societies of the Western world. Of great importance, and I think one of the greatest impacts was the introduction of a universal language, the Greek language. Alexander the Great, in unifying the Grecian Peninsula, also unified the different dialects of the Greek language into, fused into a common language, and then the armies of Alexander the Great, as they conquered the world, took that language with them, and because Alexander was interested in education, building up, you know, Alexandria and the library there. The Greek language became the language of the day. From Persia into India and all the way into the west of the Mediterranean. People could speak, write, and understand each other. It didn't ever really happen prior to that. And it's especially important when you understand how that applies to the spreading of the gospel message. Because it allowed people who were interested in God, interested in the concept of the gospel, and what the gospel talked about, and Judaism, because Christianity came from the roots of Judaism, it allowed people to understand these things, even though they weren't speakers in ancient, ancient Hebrew. Remember, 200 years before Christ, the Old Testament was translated into what language? 
the Greek language, the Septuagint. The Greek language became the lingua franca across the empire. Cultural information was facilitated and, and transferred across all regions of the empire because of a common language. Jews who were living in Judea and in Levant and the diaspora spoke the Greek language. That's why you have in the New Testament discussions about Hellenized Jews because they were being influenced heavily by Jews, by Hellenistic or Greek thought. And that's why we have in our Bibles what language is the New Testament in? Greek. It's not in Latin. It's in Greek. And finally, the Romans. The Romans codified and assimilated a lot of Greek ideas and a lot of Greek thought. There was the ability to travel great distances in some safety. They expanded the empire, the celebrated Pax Romana, the Roman period of peace, 206 years from 276 BC to 180 AD. There was relative peace with minimum expansion. They controlled all coasts of the Mediterranean Sea. The Mediterranean Sea was called the Mare Nostrum. Our sea known to us, the Romans. Most of travel was done by sea. And ironically, brothers and sisters, it's that system that ends up crucifying our Lord. It's that same system that killed Jesus that provided the system or the vehicle by which the gospel was to spread from Judea to all ends of the earth. What 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 how much irony can you can you take when you look at that? So let's spend a little time, just in the few minutes we have left, looking at the Roman Empire to try to establish a backdrop for these momentous events uh, as they occur. The face of the empire, the Caesars, a lot of connection with Christianity. There are seven emperors that reign from the period of the Gospel and the Acts. Three of them are actually mentioned in Scripture. These emperors often were very innovative, very ingenious, but at the same time brutal and corrupt. Julius Caesar united the Roman Empire from the civil wars that had been going on and passed to his nephew, Augustus, a complete empire which now morphs from a republic ruled by the Senate and the people to an empire ruled by a Caesar. Augustus solidified the empire, established order. Bandits and robbers and land and on the sea were put down and, and pacified. Good roads were set up. 53,000 miles of roads were built and maintained by the Roman government. Free communication from different parts of the empire a postal system. The Roman army and its soldiers maintained this peace, and they were the foundation of the empire's power and control. And we know that because they have such, an, such a uh, presence in the New Testament, and they're involved, the centurions and the soldiers, and the imagery that's used by Jesus and, and he, in his parables, and, and the, the spiritual principles that Paul brings out, a lot of them come from the example of the army that's all about them. The army, 300,000 to 320,000 soldiers, half of them being legionnaires, half being auxiliaries. 30 legions or armies requiring 20 years of service by Roman citizens. Rome gained complete control, control of the Mediterranean coastlands, Soldiers and armies were stationed on the frontiers in Europe, in North Africa, and in Palestine. There was law and order flowing from the empire, the Pax Romana, speaking of peace and safety. It was the time of Augustus Caesar that Jesus was born. Travel by, by sea was eased. They were able to cover great distances, roads, enabled the army to travel easily and to keep the peace. The roads ran in straight lines between cities. 
Often there were rest stops and, and inns within 20 miles, just a day's march along these roads. And a lot of these roads are still used today if you are interested in exploring it. Commercialism in the 20, in the first century was highly developed. And most importantly, it relied upon shipping in the Mediterranean. The government, the Roman government, imported 135,000 tons of wheat a year to feed just the people in the city of Rome. They had a huge grain fleet. And we remember that the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 27 traveled on a grain ship. There was far more travel in classical times than most people realized. Wayne Meeks. Wayne Meeks says in the first urban Christian that the people of the Roman Empire traveled more extensively and more easily than any people would do until the 19th century. So we have a free movement of people, of commerce, of culture, of beliefs, and eventually the gospel message. With this background, this common language, the ease of travel and safety over great distances, the scattering of the Jews in diaspora around the Roman world, the development of the synagogue system, the survival of Judaism because of that synagogue system, still does not give us a complete answer to the question of Christianity's success. How a relatively obscure preacher in the backwater of the empire would in short order motivate his followers to convert the empire. In less than 300 years, and in doing so overwhelm classical paganism. There's a lot more to it. And the coming change did not just take place on the geopolitical scene. There were societal, there were religious and cultural indicators that were ready to be challenged by the words of Jesus. And they were very susceptible to the appeal of the Gospels. And that's what we'll be talking about in the next four classes. Thank you.